So, Dr. Dubbs, if we start our whirlwind tour, why don't we start with the overweight and obesity epidemic? Sure. So, my question to you is, from your vantage point as an OBGYN, what is the importance of intervening prior to pregnancy in women who are overweight? So, uh, great question, of course, because probably one of the, the biggest paradigms that we have in maternal fetal medicine today is looking at the fetus uh, as a patient in and of itself. And what we have learned, and I think many of you in the audience uh, have heard of what the Barker hypothesis, um, but we as maternal fetal medicine specialists know that babies get imprinted with disease states while they're in the womb. And the, and the largest contributor to that is obesity. Um, women who are obese have children who are at double the risk of many different things, congenital malformations, adult onset heart disease, um, obesity as children, hypertension as teenagers, um, and even death in the first six years of life is increased twofold in women who uh, have a BMI greater than 40 who go into pregnancy. So we've done a lot in maternal fetal medicine to try and manage these patients while they're pregnant to reduce those risks, but it's simply not possible without preconceptual care, which is where you all come in. So preconceptual identification of the reproductive age woman who wants to start a family is essential to get her on the right track to making those changes in her lifestyle prior to conception. That's the only way we're going to reduce the obesity rate in the United States. In, in that we have to stop the genetic imprinting of fetuses in the womb before these women get pregnant. Hmm. And this might be a little bit too nuanced, but one question that emerges from there is whether there is any differentiation that you place in preconceptual counseling between the, the woman pr planning on conceiving who's overweight versus the woman who is obese or even morbidly obese. Does your sure. intervention planning change at all? Uh, it, it does somewhat. I mean. Uh, Overweight women also have a relative increased risk for a variety of different things. Um, but when you, when you get to class two obesity and your, and your BMI is 35 or above, uh, you start to double and triple the risk of things like congenital malformations, uh, fetal death in utero, fetal death is three times higher in women who have a BMI over 35. And this, you know, the data on this is just voluminous. I mean, it's in every single study that we've looked at. Uh, it's, it's astounding. Um, and s for many reasons, we're not quite sure why, because even if they have a high BMI, it, it, they may not get diabetic, they may not get hypertensive during the pregnancy, but yet they still have these relative risks, which are way higher than women with a BMI of 25 or less. So yes, in your, in your, uh, your question, overweight women, even, in, even who don't reach the level of, uh, of uh, significant obesity, still should be counseled preconceptually to uh, get to their ideal body weight. Excellent. I'm going to make a complete U-turn and switch to a completely different area, sure. different, um, because I want to stay on this thread of preconception counseling. Um, but let's turn over to the cardiac issues. Um, one area that you've received a question many, many times is whether women with repaired congenital heart disease can have safe pregnancies um, and deliveries. Sure. What are your thoughts on that? So uh, for many years, women who had uh, repair congenital heart disease were told never to have children. Um, and that's why my field became what it is today, because we take care of these women all the time, um, and they have wonderful outcomes. Um, uh, much like the diabetic years ago was told never to have children, or if they have kidney disease, you shouldn't have children. Um, most, 99% of all congenital heart disease that has been repaired that um, that does not have um, uh, arrhythmias or thromboembolic disease do extremely well during pregnancy, and they can have normal births, uh, and they do all the time. And in fact, uh, one of the biggest things we deal with is the fear of childbirth from the patient themselves. Shouldn't I have a cesarean section? Should I go through the stresses of labor? Uh, and in fact, uh, a major surgical procedure, which is C-section, which is probably the number one, if not the number two, most common surgical procedure in the United States um, is more risky to a woman with, with repaired congenital heart disease than a normal, well-controlled vaginal birth. Um, the stresses, of, the stresses of, of surgical intervention are way higher. So preconceptual counseling 
and a multidisciplinary approach for women who have repaired congenital heart disease is, uh, is very, very important. In fact, we have uh, a, an adult congenital heart disease center at uh, Penn that deals with these situations uh, every day. Um, and we have now thousands of women who have, who have had safe, healthy pregnancies with congenital heart disease. Why don't we continue with that theme that you mentioned, the fear of becoming pregnant, that a lot of patients come into the clinic with primary care and obstetric uh, care. One of the, the questions there for, for patients who have had a prior history of miscarriage is, can I have a safe pregnancy? How do you respond to that? Sure. So probably miscarriage is the most common thing we deal with in, in pregnancy because one in every three conceptions miscarries. So the number is huge. There's four million uh, pregnancies in the United States. A third of those are going to miscarry every year by things that we have very little control of over, most of which are genetic related. So um, those are usually sporadic events that occur during meiosis that, that you and I have no control over whatsoever. So most women who have had one or two miscarriages can be assured that their statistical likelihood of a normal pregnancy is very, very high. Um, however, the, um, the uh, Association of Reproductive Medicine actually has changed the definition of recurrent pregnancy loss. So it used to be that we wouldn't embark upon an extensive workup for pregnancy loss unless you had three or more repetitive first trimester miscarriages or uh, second trimester fetal deaths um, because statistically they were likely to go on and have normal babies. Um, in the United States, those numbers have somewhat changed in that uh, there's been a bump in recurrence risk after two losses. Um, and that's likely because of the aging population and the larger number of women entering pregnancy in their reproductive years with medical problems that may impact on miscarriage rates as well. So after two losses now, we recommend a workup. But by far, and, and, and this is something that I deal with every single day that I practice, uh, is, is reassuring women who have had these events, which are very devastating. Um, matter of fact, there's, there's a book that I, I helped uh, edit in, in Pennsylvania on the, the, uh, the, the psychological problems in pregnancy loss. And there is a fair number of women, when they miscarry at 10 weeks of pregnancy, their grieving process is very similar to those who, who, who have a loss later in pregnancy. Um, it can be just as devastating. So um, the psychological aspects are very important to deal with. But on a whole, we can reassure them that their odds are extremely high to have successful pregnancies. Well, Dr. Debs, your mentioning of the psychological problems opened up another window for me that I have to now jump through, and that has to do with some of the psychiatric issues. One in particular that's come up a lot, of which you are interested, is um, for women with a history of depression or on antidepressants, whether they can stop their antidepressants prior to conceiving, and whether they um, should as well. Right. So uh, this is a very common topic, and, and, and I, it's, a, it's amazing how many women come to me on uh, SSRIs or SSNRIs or other uh, uh, medications for mood disorders. Um, the worst thing that we can do is when, after they conceive, to stop all their medicines abruptly. And if I can give one pitch to all primary care providers is to not do that. Um, you know, call me or call somebody to discuss with them because 80% of these women will deteriorate dramatically and their disease state will worsen in a very short period of time when they abruptly stop all their medicines. It's a very common thing because everybody's afraid of the effects of, of different uh, medications on fetal development. Um, and there's a lot written on the subject. Um, what, what most people don't talk about is that the magnitude of this risk from medicines like SSRIs is extremely small. Um, so the relative risk may be higher, and, and some studies it's you know 1.8, 2.0. But when you look at the magnitude of the risk, we're talking about one in a thousand pregnancies, mm -hmm. and those risks are way smaller than the risks that all normal pregnant women take every day for a host of other other issues like preeclampsia or fetal demise or a maternal thrombo thromboembolic disease. Um, so the worst thing we can do is to abruptly stop these medications when they're pregnant. Before pregnancy, if you identify somebody who um, is, uh, is planning to, to start a family, you may want to adjust their medication. And in some cases, you may find that a slow wean over time will do them a, a, a host of good because many of them started antidepressants because of a, uh, a situational issue 
uh, such as marital discourse or some issue in their family, and they just tended to continue that medication for years and years on end. And there's a large group of these women who can safely wean off their medicines prior to pregnancy. But the caveat to that is that the outcome of these pregnancies is very good. There's still things that we don't know, but we do know that most of these medications do not cause congenital malformations, despite what you may read on billboards riding down Route 70 um, by lawyers. There is uh, the magnitude of the risk of congenital malformations is no different than the general population. In other words, the 3% risk of malformations in babies is the same on the majority of antidepressants that women are on and mood stabilizers as well. Um, the issue is, is when you look at body systems separately, there's a slight bump in the relative risk of cardiac defects, but the magnitude of that risk is approximately one in a thousand. Eight in 1,000 women will have a baby with congenital heart disease if they take nothing. Nine in 1,000 women will have congenital heart disease if they take a bunch of these medicines. The question is, is when you explain the magnitude of the risk to most patients, they're like, ah, I'd rather stay on my medication than, mm -hmm. than take the chance of ending up in the hospital again uh, for suicidal ideation. And is that a difficult uh, idea, concept, to be able to communicate to clinicians who've become very accustomed to thinking about relative risk rather than the magnitude. Is that something that no. you have to work through? Is that actually gaining traction now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that we all have a duty to sort of put these in terms that our patients can understand. Um, and so when we talk about the magnitude of risk, it's extremely small. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's probably less than some of the risks that most people take every day, particularly when they're pregnant, for instance, eating too much uh, tuna and getting mercury overload and having a baby with a lower IQ is probably higher risk than it is taking an antidepressant in many cases. Excellent. I have time for one more question for you, so I'm going to change gears again, um, or shift gears, I should say, and that is move into the endocrine side. Sure. One question that involves hypothyroidism, hypothyroidism and whether or not it affects pregnancy outcomes. What are your thoughts? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, so that's a, that's a big topic, uh, and we've been struggling with that for years, um, in that does uh, subclinical or even clinical uh, uh, or symptomatic hypothyroidism um, impact on the IQ of a baby? Uh, so, so this is all based on a New England Journal article that came out over 15 years ago that suggested that if a woman has a TSH of greater than 10, their children had a much lower IQ than women who did not. And uh, as is common in medicine, uh, the data gets sort of bastardized over time, mm -hmm. and it became if your TSH is over four or over three or over five. And so now we have probably 20% of our population being treated for subclinical disease. So the answer to your question is, is the landmark study was just completed actually by the Maternal Fetal Medicines Network, which if you're not familiar with that, it's 13 institutions in the United States that do well done, large scale randomized trials. Penn is one of the centers in the country. We finished that trial uh, last year, the data came out, and subclinical hypothyroidism has absolutely no effect on long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes. Um, now, there's a caveat to that. If women have risk factors, such as other autoimmune diseases, uh, infertility, or uh, obesity, um, or they are symptomatic, um, it does appear that in the first trimester, a TSH level greater than 2.5, which all of us would say, ah, that's normal, right? Um, but a TSH level of 2.5 has a substantial relative risk of miscarriage in the first trimester, only in the subgroup of women who have other symptoms or autoimmune disease. In women who have no other risk factors and have no symptoms, there's no increased risk for any pregnancy outcome that we worry about. And when you mention symptoms, you're saying uh, these aren't subtle symptoms that are um, that one clinician might question another. These are grossly apparent symptoms. Absolutely, grossly apparent symptoms, yeah. Okay. Well, Dr. Debs, Obviously, we could be here for quite some time. There's a lot of topics to cover, but we, sure. in the interest of time, have to conclude. I want to thank you again for, for joining us. Thank you. All right. <laughs>